Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Professor Abdussalam Yasin Taha from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani, giving a talk on thoracic approaches to esophagectomy. You can watch this lecture and others on my YouTube channel by using the URL at the bottom of the slide. We start by describing the anatomy of the esophagus, and then we proceed with surgical considerations, and we describe the different methods of uh, esophagectomy via thoracotomy, and we conclude by take-home messages. The esophagus is a part of the alimentary tract. It is a muscular tube approximately 25 centimeters long, extending from the pharynx to the stomach. The esophagus begins at the lower margin of the cricoid cartilage opposite the six cervical vertebra and enters the gastric orifice at the level of the 12 thoracic vertebra. The esophagus passes through uh, three compartments, the neck, the chest and the abdomen. Therefore, it can be divided into a cervical, thoracic, and abdominal segments. The cervical segment extends from C6 to T1 and begins at a continuation of the pharynx about 15 centimeters from the incisor teeth. It lies in front of the spine, pre-vertebral, and surrounded by the deep and middle cervical fascia, and anteriorly it is attached to the trachea. And in the neck, the esophagus slightly curves or deviates to the left side. So this is the uh, cervical segment of the esophagus lying in front of the spine and uh, behind the trachea and the left meniscus bronchus, de deviating slightly to the left side. The thoracic oesophagus, T1 to T10 of the oesophagus, descends from the superior mediastinum to the lower posterior mediastinum and turns slightly to the right of the spine. It courses behind the trachea from the superior mediastinum downward, where it is attached to the left main bronchus. The aortic arch, which becomes the descending thoracic aorta, runs on the left side of the oesophagus. The thoracic aorta gives rise to branches from which this portion of the oesophagus directly receives its best supply. So in this picture, we see that the uh, esophagus extends from the superior mediastinum down to the posterior mediastinum, lying behind the trachea and the left meniscus bronchus. It is accompanied by the descending thoracic aorta, which gives esophageal branches to the esophagus. The abdominal segment T10 to T11 is about 1.2 to 2.5 centimeters in length. It takes a conical course while running between the below the diaphragm from the esophageal hiatus to enter the cardiac part of the stomach. The abdominal portion lies intraperitoneal and is surrounded by a serosal coat. The arterial supply of the oesophagus, as we can see in this picture, we have the inferior thyroid artery arising from the left subclavian artery, gives esophageal branches to the cervical oesophagus, and we have uh, aortic esophageal arteries arising from the descending thoracic aorta, supplying the thoracic oesophagus, and we have 
the ascending branches of the left gastric artery and the ascending branches of the phrenic artery supplying the abdominal esophagus. In this picture, we see the relationship of the esophagus to different structures in the neck and the, in the chest. It is obvious that the esophagus lies behind the trachea and the left meniscus bronchus and accompanied by the descending thoracic aorta. And regarding the cross section of the wall of the esophagus, we have uh, an outer longitudinal muscle layer and an inner circular muscle layer. And then we have the mucosa and the submucosa. The vagus nerve uh, uh, forms two nerve plexuses. The first one lies between the two muscle layers and therefore it's called myenteric plexus or the airbox plexus. And the second nerve plexus lies in the submucosa and is called Meissner's plexus. In this picture, again, we see the esophageal branches of the inferior thyroid artery and the, ar the aortic esophageal branches, as well as the ascending branches of the left gastric artery. In regard to the venous drainage, the venous drainage starts with the short gastric veins and the coronary vein in the abdomen, and then the uh, uh, azygous and hemiazygous venous system drains the esophagus. As any other organ in the body, the esophagus has a lymphatic drainage, starting with the parahiatal lymph nodes in the abdomen and the paraesophageal lymph nodes or station number eight in the chest, as well as the subcarinal lymph nodes and later, later on the paratracheal lymph nodes. And in regard to the, to, to the nerve supply, there are two important cranial nerves, the right vagus nerve and the left vagus nerve. The right vagus nerve gives rise to the right recurrent laryngeal nerve hooking around the right subclavian artery. And the left vagus nerve gives rise to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve hooking around the ligamentum arteriosum. And in the abdomen, the two vagi form the left or anterior vagal trunk and the right or the posterior vagal trunk. In this picture, we can see a topography of the esophagus. The cervical esophagus begins 15 centimeters from the incisor teeth. The cervical portion is about three to five centimeters. The thoracic part is about 20 to 24 centimeters. The abdominal part is about two to six centimeters. Therefore, the entire adult thoracic esophagus is about 25 centimeters. Curves of the esophagus. This is uh, an important anatomical fact which decides the uh, uh, side of or the approach to uh, esophagus at surgery. The esophagus has a three gentle curves in the neck behind the left primary bronchus below the bifurcation of the trachea and behind the pericardium. And in terms of vertebral levels, the esophagus is to the left of the midline at T1 to the right of the midline at T6, and to the left of the midline again at T10. Surgical considerations. For a surgical, from surgical standpoint, lesions of the upper half of the thoracic esophagus should be explored through a right thoracotomy to avoid technical problems with the aortic arch while lesions of the lower half of the thoracic esophagus can be explored through a left or a right thoracotomy. 
with the right-sided approach, the azygous vein should be ligated and divided where it crosses the right wall of the esophagus to empty into the posterior wall of the superior vena cava. Ligation of the azygous vein has no, prob no uh, uh, L effects. Now in this diagram, we can see the right side of the mediastinum showing the deposition of its contents. That is the azygous vein draining into the superior vena cava and the oesophagus uh, uh, is lying posterior to the trachea. And this is the right vagus nerve. And this is the hilum of the right lung. And this is the, in the pulmonary ligament at the bottom. And this is a diagram of the left side of the mediastinum. On the left side, the arch of the aorta and the descending thoracic aorta obscures most of the oesophagus, except two triangular areas, the oesophageal triangle uh, upwards uh, is formed by the descending uh, arch of the aorta, the left subclavian artery, and the vertebral column. The floor of the triangle is formed by the mediastinal pleura, beneath which the oesophagus is located. And the other triangular area is the uh, Truesdale's triangle uh, lower down, which is uh, bounded by the descending aorta posteriorly, the pericardium anteriorly, and the diaphragm inferiorly. So this is uh, a picture of the right side of the mediastinum after removal of the right lung. We'll see, we see that it is dominated by veins, particularly the azygous vein. When this vein is ligated and divided, we can have an access to, the to almost the entire oesophagus. While the red side of the mediastinum, that is the left side, is dominated by the uh, arch of the aorta and the descending aorta and the main branches. So we have only two triangular areas in which the oesophagus can be uh, explored, the oesophageal triangle upwards and the uh, true saddle triangle uh, lower down. Extent of the pleura. The lower end of the thoracic oesophagus covered by pleura may be found, as we said, in the triangle of trusdal, which is formed by the diaphragm below, the pericardium above and anteriorly, and the descending aorta posteriorly. The posterior approximation of the right and left pleurae between the oesophagus and the aorta forms the so-called mesoesophagus. The right pleura is in contact with the lower one-third of the oesophagus, almost to the diaphragmatic hiatus. This proximity of the right pleura to the hiatus introduces the risk of pneumothorax during abdominal operations on the hiatus. The anterior approximation of the two pleurae is at the external angle. So in this picture, we see that the right and left pleurae are very close to each other behind the angle of the sternum. The indications for esophagectomy include benign and malignant conditions. The benign uh, indications include undilatable benign structure, mega esophagus from achalasia, reoperative foregut surgery after fundoplication, acid or alkali ingestion, traumatic conditions, benign tumors, 
unrepairable leak of or fistula, gastric conduit necrosis. While the malignant conditions include esophageal cancer in which plant or primary esophagectomy is performed, salvage esophagectomy for sarcomatoid cancer and for local regional involvement of miscellaneous malignancies. These contrast esophageograms show uh, two uh, disease conditions. A lifelong achalasia may produce the sigmoid uh, uh, mega esophagus uh, in which esophagectomy is indicated. Esophageal cancer uh, can produce narrowing of the uh, irregular narrowing of the esophagus or the uh, uh, narrowing of the lower esophagus, and both of them are indications for esophagectomy. This slide is very important as it summarizes the different types of trans thoracic uh, esophagectomies. Either lose esophagectomy, which is uh, the main subject of our uh, talk today, consists of a right thoracotomy plus laparotomy. We might have hybrid esophagectomy, such as laparoscopic abdominal approach plus thoracotomy, or laparotomy plus thoracoscopic approach, or the uh, option A or option B plus neck anastomosis. And you might have minimally invasive esophagectomy, such as laparoscopic abdominal approach plus thoracoscopic approach, or the option A plus neck anastomosis. Also, we might have the McQueen esophagectomy or the so-called three-field esophagectomy, which consists of an abdominal incision, thoracic incision, and a neck incision. And finally, we might have left-sided thoracoabdominal esophagectomy through left-sided thoracophrenolaparotomy. History of transthoracic esophagectomies. The Ivan Lewis Esophagectomy is one of the only surgical procedures named after a surgeon by first and last name and was proposed in 1946 at the Royal College of Surgeons Humanitarian Lecture by Dr. Either Lewis. During this area, the standard approach to mid thoracic esophageal tumors was a transhiatal blunt esophagectomy, cervical esophagostomy, gastrostomy, and skin tube reconstruction. The original operation of Ivor Lewis was described as a two stage approach that included a laparotomy and gastric mobilization based on the right gastric and gastro epiploic arcades, followed by one or two weeks later by a right thoracotomy with esophageal resection and esophageogastric anastomosis in the chest. Exceeding the expectations of, the, of that time, the operation was successful 70% of the times. Today, this operation is usually completed in one day and in one stage. Ivor Lewis approach. Approximately 10,000 new cases of carcinoma of the, of the oesophagus occur each year in the United States. Surgical resection continues to play an important role in the treatment of this disease and can be performed in a variety of ways. In 1946, as we said, Ivor Lewis 
described an operative approach for neoplasms of the distal esophagus, including an abdominal procedure to surgically stage the tumor and mobilize the stomach, followed by a right thoracotomy to resect the involved esophagus and the stomach and reestablish gastrointestinal continuity with an esophageal gastric anastomosis in the chest. Currently, the Ivor Lewis approach is widely applied for any carcinoma occurring in the middle or lower esophagus or gastroesophageal junction. So this is uh, a picture uh, or an illustration of Ivor Lewis approach, which consists of an upper midline laparotomy plus right thoracotomy. All patients with upper and mid esophageal tumors should undergo either rigid or fiber optic bronchoscopy prior to resection to rule out tumor invasion into the membranous trachea. Tracheal invasion is an absolute contraindication to resection. Now let us uh, uh, discuss the different steps of the operation. We start with the abdominal uh, 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 portion of Ivor Lewis approach. Step one, intubate the patient with a double lumen endotracheal tube and place patient in a supine position for the abdominal portion of the procedure. An upper midline incision is made extending from the xiphoid process to just above the umbilicus. Step two, explore the abdomen thoroughly to rule out metastases of the liver, peritoneum, and omentum. These would preclude resection. Abdominal retractors can be used to facilitate exposure of the stomach. Step three, divide the left triangular and left coronary ligaments of the liver with electrocautery. The left lobe of the liver can then be retracted to the right with the abdominal retractor. Next, divide the phrenoesophageal ligament and encircle the esophagus and the hiatus with a large penrose drain. The right cross of diaphragm can be divided to ensure that four fingers can easily fit through the hiatus, uh, thus avoiding any compression on the gastric conduit. Step four, detach the greater omentum from the stomach, taking care not to injure the right gastroepiploic artery. Step five, divide the short gastric vessels. This can be done by first ligating the vessels or using a coagulating cutting device or the harmonic scalpel. Step six, the stomach is then retracted superiorly and the left gastric artery and vein are dissected close to the aorta and inferior vena cava. All nodal tissue should be swept toward the stomach to ensure that it is included in the resected specimen. The artery and vein are individually ligated with silk sutures and divided. Step seven, perform a cocher maneuver to mobilize the duodenum. And since the stomach is denervated by the esophagectomy, a pyloromyotomy or pyloroplasty is usually performed at this point and insert a feeding uh, genostomy tube as a final step in the abdominal uh, portion. So in this picture, we see mobilization of the stomach for esophageal replacement. The greater curvature has been mobilized, preserving the right gastroepiploic and the right gastric arteries. The short gastric arteries and the left gastric 
uh, arteries are divided and a pyloro uh, myotomy is performed. And in this picture, we can see how the stomach is retracted superiorly in order to do ligation and division of the short gastric and left gastric arteries. Formation of gastric tube. Formation of an isoperistaltic gastric tube starts at the fundus. It follows the direction of the uh, pylorus and is most easily performed with a stapler. The longer the stapler, the less steps are needed. During the use of the stapler, it is important to stretch the stomach longitudinally to avoid shortening of the gastric tube caused by the stapler. To avoid gaps between the stepple lines, place the next stapler exactly behind the previous row of stepples. And number one represents the gastro epiploic vessels. Well, what uh, uh, comment we uh, want to mention here that some surgeons do not uh, uh, fashion a gastric tube, but they use the stomach as uh, a whole organ. The thoracic portion, step nine, the patient is placed in a left lateral decubitus position, reprepped and redraped, and the right lung is deflated to facilitate the esophageal dissection, make a right posterolateral thoracotomy through the fifth or fifth interspace, like in this picture. The serratus anterior muscle is usually not divided, but reflected anteriorly. Explore the chest to rule out pulmonary or pleural metastases, which would preclude resection. Step 10, going from distal to proximal, open the mediastinal pleura anterior and posterior to the oesophagus. Avoid injury to the thoracic duct, which lies between the aorta, vertebrae, and a zygous vein. When thoracic duct injury is suspected, the duct should be ligated at the hiatus. Step 11, encircle the oesophagus with a pinrose drain below the level of the carina. All periosophageal tissue and lymph nodes should be included in the resection, ligate and divide the azygous vein, dissect the oesophagus away from the airway, taking care not to injure the membranous portion of the carina or left meniscus bronchus. Step 12, mobilize the stomach into the chest, taking care to keep the lesser curvature positioned laterally. For distal tumors, transect the oesophagus above the level of the azygous vein. For more proximal tumors, transect higher up. Oncologic principles indicate a margin that is a minimum of nine centimeters from the tumor. Step 13, use a linear stapler to divide the stomach beginning at the angle of his and extending toward the lesser curvature. Ligate and divide the left gastro artery after a second or third branch. The gastric transection is continued through this area on the lesser curvature of the stomach. The gastric staple line may be over soon with a running 3O absorbable suture. Step 14, place a satinsky clamp several centimeters above the point of esophageal transection and divide the oesophagus with a scalpel. The specimen is then sent for proximal and distal frozen section margins. With an electrocautery, make a linear gastrotomy, the same width as that of the oesophagus, 
and perform the esophageal gastric anastomosis either in a single or double layer fashion. Single layer anastomoses are constructed using interrupted 3O silk sutures. So this picture shows uh, a demonstration of mid thoracic esophageal tumor and Penrose drains <coughs> have been uh, placed around the esophagus above and below the tumor. The esophagus vein has been clipped, clipped and divided. Mobilization of the mid esophageal tumor through a right thoracotomy is shown in this picture. A penrose drain uh, is placed around the oesophagus, which is dissected away from the posterior membranous trachea. Division of the azygous vein facilitates the, di the dissection. And this is the intrathoracic Esophageal gastric anastomosis uh, has been performed and placed at the apex of the chest. The stomach may be suspended uh, with, in the, with the prevertebral fascia. And prior to completing the anastomosis, an esogastric tube should be advanced through the anastomosis into the stomach and place two uh, pleural tubes or two chest tubes, one near the anastomosis and the other one near the diaphragm and close the chest in the uh, standard fashion. <clears throat> now the term uh, subtotal uh, in-block esophagectomy refers to resection uh, of the esophagus uh, for malignant conditions as uh, in, along with the uh, uh, lymph nodes and the uh, nearby tissues. So the goal of this operation is to remove an esophageal cancer with the widest possible lymphatic clearance to field lymph adenectomy, which comprises upper abdominal lymph adenectomy and lymphatic clearance of the posterior and mid mediastinum. Reconstruction is accomplished by either gastric tube or colonic interposition. So the position of the patient uh, is like that, left-sided positioning of the patient with thoracic kinking. The skin incision uh, starts from the apex of the scapula in the sub mammalian fold in the fifth intercostal space. Now, after thoracotomy in the fifth intercostal space, two retractors are placed to retract the ribs, single lung ventilation, and the incision of the mediastinal pleura along the marked line for end block uh, esophagectomy. The incision of the pleura starts from the pulmonary ligament lower down, runs along the dorsal part of the uh, right lung hilum to the lateral margin of the uh, SVC up to the upper thoracic aperture. Incision direction is changed to the right lateral margin of the spine down to the diaphragm along the azygous vein. The most important part of this step is the recognition of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve and the right phrenic nerves. So here, the first step is the incision of the, in, of the pulmonary ligament. For exposure of the pulmonary ligament, the surgeon's left hand pushes the lung superiorly and laterally, the lymphatic tissue of the pulmonary ligament should be dissected towards the oesophagus. The upper margin of the pulmonary ligament 
that is the inferior pulmonary vein should not be injured during this procedure. Dissection of the junction of the azygous vein and the superior vena cava with a right angle clamp, double ligature ligation of the vein adjacent to the superior vena cava. The lymph adenectomy starts from the SVC to the confluence of the two innominate veins. Preparation of the origin of the recurrent laryngeal nerve from the vagus nerve, inferior to its origin. The vagus nerve is pushed towards the in-block specimen. The lymph adenectomy is performed along the dorsal wall, the dorsal wall of the SVC. A complete preparation of the SVC, or a complete isolation of the SVC, the trachea and the uh, right and left menstrual bronchi should be cleared from the lymphatic tissue. The paratracheally situated fat and lymphatic tissue is dissected towards the uh, oesophagus by sharp dissection or electrocautery and later resected in a block with the oesophagus. Dissection of the retrotracheal lymph nodes, they should be dissected towards the oesophagus. Care should be taken to avoid injury to the uh, membranous part of the trachea. Dissection of the uh, carinal and paraosophageal lymph nodes. Dissection and digation of the intercostal uh, veins, which should drain into, uh, into the azygous vein for any block resection with the azygous vein. These are the intercostal veins have been ligated and divided. Lymph adenectomy of the uh, sub uh, carinal lymph nodes. And for a better exposure of this area, the oesophagus should be held aside with a sponge. Or alternatively, the oesophagus can be encircled with rubber bands. And then we come to the uh, branches of the aorta that supply the oesophagus. Paraortic uh, lymph adenectomy with continuous traction on the oesophagus, the paraortic lymph adenectomy can be performed. The oesophageal branches of the thoracic aorta have to be dissected very carefully and should be ligated with suture ligation. Transection of the thoracic duct with double ligation, caudal to the tracheal bifurcation, and directly above the diaphragm. So this segment of the thoracic duct will be included with the specimen. Completion of the mediastinal lymph adenectomy with removal of the left-sided paraortic and retro pericardial lymph nodes down to the oesophageal hiatus. After complete mobilization of the in-block oesophageal specimen, thoracic drains are placed in the right thoracic cavity. The thoracic incision is closed and the patient's position is changed for the abdominal part to a supine position. The take home messages of our lecture, the most commonly used surgical approach for the resection of carcinoma of the thoracic oesophagus incorporates two incisions, a right thoracotomy and upper midline laparotomy with or without a cervical incision. Less commonly used approaches are the left thoracotomy and the transhiatal uh, esophagectomy. Uh, through an upper midline abdominal and a cervical incision or a minimally invasive approach. These approaches 
may be discussed in subsequent lectures. This is the list of bibliography used in the, prepara in the preparation of our lecture. And this is an interesting and an inspiring video بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهو الذي خلق الليل والنهار والشمس والقمر كل في فلك يسبحون In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful and it is he who created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each swimming in an orbit. Holy Quran. So this is the end of our lecture. Thank you for watching and listening. This is Professor Abdul Salam Yasin Taha signing off from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani. <laughs>